Um, okay, what I'm going to talk about in this talk is significantly different from all the workshop or uh, introduction talks because I'm really talking about the research what I'm doing on, I would say, my biophysics side of my group. Um, we are interested in biomembranes, especially into support and catalytic bodies. So, this is this was my view about a year ago, so you recognize Josh there somewhere in the middle. Um, there have been a number of collaborators involved. Funding has been largely from the National Science Foundation, in this case the CBI program, Cyber Discovery Initiative. Um, older work was on the US Department of Agriculture, I mean the Biofuels program, and some smaller fund. And computer type was largely Pacific Northwest National Lab. So, why do we do study on biomembranes? Because the membrane is the first point of contact a cell encounters with its environment. So, if you want to understand how cells interact with the environment, you have to understand what a membrane does in con contact with the environment. And you may have sugars in the environment, you may have alcohols, you may have substrates. And in this talk, I'm largely focusing on substrates. I've worked on sugars and alcohols before, so if people are interested, we can talk about this as well. Um, there is a significant multi-scale modeling challenge here. If you look at the whole cell, you have now uh, length scales on what micron scale or something like that, with many, many membranes in there, the extracellular membrane and many intracellular membranes, a lot of research as well. If you drill down the membrane, you get this typical patch of the membrane where you have your lipids, where you have cholesterol. The uh, transmembrane proteins, by weight it's about 50 50 between the proteins and the lipids, so it's a highly crowded environment actually. So, most things what we are doing with our model lipids has not too much to do with the real experiment on the cell level. But that's actually not the focus of this talk. I'm largely talking about supported bilayers, developed bilayers, which are the applications are more in the biosensing and nanotechnology area where we are really having to do with a lot of more or less pristine bilayers. Um, so, just to remind you all of you people who haven't seen a lipid before, um, what are the lipids in the system? There are maybe, so you have the typical phosphocholine lipids, now you have the tails, which are essentially oils, low molecular oils on the level between 10 and 20 carbons. Um, there's a degree of saturation or unsaturation, so if you have only single bonds, you have fully saturated bonds. EPC, or you have the OPC, which has a kink, which means you have a double bond in there and then you have a single unsaturation. We are also talking about single unsaturated or fully saturated bonds because actually our body can only take these, or the others we have to take in from the environment. And then there are a lot of steroids involved, there may be cholesterol and erosterol in the system. I'm not talking about that in detail in this case because I'm looking at largely the EPC systems. And there are a number of, then you have the head groups, you have the PC head group, the phosphocholine head group, which is uncharged, that you can swim around on, where you have typically more or less a minus one charge on the phosphate and a plus one charge on the nitrogen, so you have phosphate is here, and the choline group is one nitrogen with um, three CH3 groups around it. Then there are a number of charged ones, and maybe phosphatic acid, phosphatic visceral, or phosphatic serine. And they are normally at the minus one. The phosphatidic acid is actually a double acid that also has a zero and a minus two possibility. At normal pH, however, it's a minus one. So, what is the motivation of our study? There are many, many experiments being done on sport or tether with binaries. So, you have a solid substrate and you have either a bilayer floating on top that's supported with bilayer. Or you have a television file where you have a chemical connection between the support and the substrate. So I'm largely talking about support ones if I can time in the end. I'm talking about the other ones what we're doing right now. They are a standard experimental technique because things like EFM or so can be easily done on a support file system. They are hard to do, on other, although not impossible, on free systems or on cells themselves. 
And they are very important for nanotechnology. A lot of biosensors are support binding and uh, some protein in there. And then you have the protein really in a very confined environment. We all know that MD can do a lot of um, to understand the real structure and the physical mechanisms of the system, and they provide direct insight into highly complicated systems. However, support and tell the values have almost not been studied in computational properties. We have the first time we published on this 2008 was actually the first coarse grain molecular based study of the support bilayer. The very first study I'm aware of is work coming out actually out of Corning, which was an atomistic simulation about 2006. They've done an atomistic simulation of a fully, um, of a deep PC bilayer on a silicon substrate. It was a group of high -tech. So, this is actually an exp uh, these are experiments which are done, which have both been done in the group of Marty Longo in my department. These are the supported bilayer of two lipids. The system is phase separated. This is AFM data. So, you see, this is about a micron here. This is a perfectly flat system. Experimentally, typically, we produce mica because mica can essentially be molecularly smooth. And then we have a <laughs> small water layer on top, and there's a big debate how big that water layer is and what's the structure of the water actually between the phi layer and the substrate. And then you have the sub, then you have your phi layer, and then you have a free water layer on top. This, uh, this on the other hand, is perhaps a bit harder to see. This is a supported phi layer sub. Um, on an error gel, on a zero gel. Well, a zero gel is a rough system. The advantage there, you may have larger water pockets below the system, so that if you put now protein in there, you may have less contact with the bilayer, uh, with the substrate, and you may have easier function of the protein. That's a big problem in support of bilayer. If you have proteins in there, they interact with the substrate. And one of the ideas to avoid that. Could be something like this. This work um, from PhD thesis of Eric Oxu, who did this also in March, almost two or three years ago. So, when we talk about simulations, these are the typical levels of detail which are available to us. We have seen a lot on these two elements. And this is an simulation. This is the Martini model. We are actually using a lot of the Martini model in this year. And this is the model which was developed by Marcus de Cerno, either called the de Cerno Cook model or more recently also the snowman model, because it has three beats which essentially look like a snowman. Um, and there's actually a, this uh, written a few years ago, it was a, again a book chapter where we looked about multiscale modeling on a number of different these systems. So this is density profiles of a, of a atomistic simulation, of a Martini model simulation, and of this cook the several model simulation. So this is the system I'm largely talking about today. That is the bilayer, with rough water, and that is the subject. Um, this is actually the atomistic representation we are largely talking about the cross grain representation because we are interested in much larger details, but this is the full this is the DPPC system on the pure silicon substrate. Um, you may have seen the Martini model. Martini model, we are actually using in this case a version of the old 1.4. Yes? That was 128 pieces of it. Last about 3,000 points. Most simulation I'm talking about today is 512 coarse grain units. Going up to 8,000 if needed. And then on the very coarse grain, the Cerno model, you're going between 20 and 60,000 units. Then we can do small vessels. Um, this is a DPPC and its representation and on the Martini level, just to remind you, that's about three to four heavy atoms per interaction size. This is the standard simulation I'm first talking about. It's 500 grams of DPPC lipids on a hydrophilic substrate. It's not a particular substrate, it's about the hydrophilicity of a typical silicon. It's uncharged in contrast to a lot of the real um, systems. And what we immediately see, just looking at it, that the two sides of the system are significantly different. There's significant difference in order, mainly in the head groups, between the proximal side and the distant side. 
The proximal side is the one which is closer to the substrate, the distal side is the one which is further. I'm using these terms now as a term. And you see that there is the water here is essentially looks crystalline, however it is, it is really a highly ordered fluid system. There's essentially no difference in the diffusion coefficient uh, in the water layer below and above the system. So this is actually work we'll show you a shape, and this is just to show you the two systems again in comparison. First thing we looked at is the profile, obviously. Uh, what you see on the right is the free standing bar layer, just by flying sea liquids. And this is just the inner leaflet, the outer leaflet without the hand groups, and you see that all this is perfectly symmetric. What you see on the left is two things. First of all, you see these very high peaks here. They are a bit overestimated. Um, the cross grain level, they, if you go to a higher level model, you wouldn't have that much of a peak, but essentially they are. You have too much, a bit of too much order, although we don't crystallize the system, it is still fluid. The main difference also is that the black and the blue and the red are now significantly different. So the distal and the proximal layer are different. This is a very old simulation. In this case, we have the same number of lipids on both leaflets, which we now know is not true. So we later on calculated actually the free energy of transport between them, and now we know that there are more lipids actually in the proximal side than in the distal side. This was the first system. The difference is not that large. So the system doesn't flip flop by itself, but there is a difference. Yeah. Okay. So the previous, uh, so in the, the understanding that so this is the this is the density of water near the surfaces, right? Yes. So why is there any fluctuation? What do you mean fluctuation? So there should be some like because of uh, some order. This is fluctuations. This is the free standing system. This is the system. You see, it is like fluctuations. <laughs> so, the first question was, how much water is actually below the binary? Between the support and the binary. In this case, we saw the simulation that now we have, it looks like we have about two water layers, so there's the density integrated from the substrate, so you have one water layer, two water layers, and then essentially the binary comes together, so that doesn't change anymore. But, how do you make sure that this is actually a good way? That you have enough water or not enough water? It turns out that that is not at all a problem. Because bilayers, lipid bilayers are in contrast to what you all think, actually quite permeable to water. We have to run experimental permeability. And now we simulated the system. This is over four nanoseconds, over four microseconds. So if you, this is time, this is a rescaled martini, so it's one microsecond of simulation. So Four microseconds. We took the system, we took 60 waters out, or we took 60 waters in more than we had in the beginning. We re ran the simulation. Comes back to exactly where we had it. So, lipid bilayers are not water -tiny. Not at all. They are water, they are water, um, tied to a lot of other um, systems, but they are not tied to water. At least in the other phase. If you go to Albita, that's a different story. If you are in the gel phase, that's a different story. But this is the normal liquid crystal at alpha phase, and water goes through actually on the time scale of microseconds. But most people don't simulate microseconds, so you don't really don't see that. But at the microsecond time scale, you easily see water transport back and forth. I'm sorry, and this is what the alpha and the. Yeah. That's the, the, the two standard phases of the, of the biomembrane. L alpha is the normal liquid, uh, liquid disorder phase, L beta is the liquid order phase. Yes? The diffusion because there are some experimental data which actually came out after this from um, out of Carnegie Mellon which show that the diffusion in the two leaflets is significantly different. And so the black and the red are actually two leaflets in the, in the free bilayer, which are obviously have to be the same. So you see that it's like these are mean space, but they're essentially the same. The green and the red and the blue are 
the support bond amp, you see that the green one, which is this leaflet, is essentially the same as a free bond amp. Whereas the blue one, which is a proximal leaflet, is slow by about an order of magnitude. Which is about, which is reasonably comparable to experiments. Experiments are not exactly the same system because a system like this cannot be exactly measured experimentally for the diffusion because the, they are the lipids flip flop to pass. We don't have that problem, obviously, because our flip flop is slow. And, but not too slow, but we cannot simulate for minutes at a time that we actually see the flip flop. But experimentally, if you get them on, you have too much flip flop in order to see the difference between the two sides. And this is again the same this leaflet versus proximal leaflet. This is the reorientation of the head groups between the two sides. Okay. You have the head group. So you have here say the N and you have here the P. You can define this vector. And you can measure how this vector reorients. And what you see is reorient on time scale of a few nanoseconds. But again, the disk leaflet is faster than the proximal leaflet. Interestingly, it goes to a lower value. First of all, you have the reason why this doesn't go to zero is again the point that you don't have flip flop. The bilinear itself is a bias, and essentially the PN vector essentially goes outward in order to completely correlate the relative flip flop. You don't have that time, so we don't see that. Second, there are two different values. The lower value is the, disk, uh, is the proximal input, and then we actually have two different conformations which are important that assist the flip flop switches between the two. Thank you. One big question we were talking about and we looked into the systems is pressure, lateral pressure profiles. Lateral pressure profiles are increasingly discussed in the area of, support, of lipid body of general. The main reason is the idea of understanding anesthesia. It goes back to uh, Robert Cantor. Robert Cantor essentially said that if you measure uh, if you change a system by adding an anesthetic, the anesthetic doesn't directly interact with the protein. If you think of a very simple anesthetic, say like a xenon or halothane or so, there are no receptors for that. But it changes the protein, uh, the, lip, the membrane structure. The membrane structure changes the pressure profile within the membrane, interacting with the protein. The protein has a different pressure environment, has to change conformation, therefore it's controlled. That's essentially one of the ideas. So we've, uh, we've done a lot of simulations to understand natural pressure. This is kind of really how this is looking like. You have here your natural, you have here more as natural system if the pressure is changing, the system has to respond and the protein has to change. That's essentially the point that way. So if you look, if you measure the lateral pressure profile in a normal lipid bilayer, what you're getting is something like this. This is going through, this is a full free system, and what you normally see, you see a high pressure in the area of the head groups, you see a neg quite negative pressure in the, as the interfacial pressure where you see the pressure compressed, and then you have the entropy of the tails which try to repel each other, and again they are, they are positive. The surprising thing, first of all, is the numbers we see. They're talking of plus 500 to minus 1,000 the important thing is the integrated the integral over that is that this what you would expect and works all well perfectly fine and normally at point zero. But these numbers are surprisingly large. This is the pressure profile of an atomistic bilayer, is a black one. Um, the great the dotted one is first one we got in our course process. What you see is you get many the main features, but it is less pronounced. And then again, it's not surprising because we lost some of the details. So again, you get about a scaling, you had to add about a scaling factor of about four, which is the same what you have all the photodynamics. So because the system was never optimized for pressure, we had to correct it comparing to atomistic simulations. So, we did that. Now we put the system on a support. This one is the free body. The full line is now the support line. But we now did the integrated the difference between the two. 
ignoring the direct interaction of the surface because it's the surface water that doesn't matter. But this is the final term. We integrated this, and we integrated this over a typical volume the transmembrane protein has in the system. So integral PDV is an energy. That is the energy the protein kind of experiences. But that's the energy difference. And that energy difference is on the order, interestingly, of about 40 kT. Why is that significant? Because 40 kT is about the activation energy of the mechanosensitive channel. That means now the membrane does work on the protein, which is about the same as the act to activate the mechanosensitive channel. What is that? That is a very bad use for everybody who wants to make it. Um, Biosensors based on support of bilayers. You don't only have to avoid the direct interaction of the protein with the membrane, but you also have to make sure that this pressure change in the system doesn't mess with your protein, that you have a protein which is relatively insensitive mechanically. Now I want to come back to what I started in the beginning. I said, okay, we have atomistic we have we assumed we have the same number of limits on both sides. Imagine we said, we said it may not be the right way to do it, so what did we do? This is not a uh, rather sample simulation. So we took the bilayer, we took a lipid, and by our rather sampling, we dragged this lipid from one liquid down to the other. And measured, therefore, the free energy of transfer between liquids. If two liquids are in equilibrium with each other, the free energy of transfer is so, first what we did is we took a free bilayer, actually we took a free bilayer with one little bit more on one side and the other, and dragged it through. That obviously has to have really uh, a zero, because there's nothing else but flipping the bilayer by 180 degrees. That's the symmetry operation. It turns out that we got about 1.5 kT, so that 1.5 kT is our error of the system. This here are tracers in our simulations. The free energy from here to here has to be zero. So these are, it says here, for example, P64, P67, to P63, P68. That means 64 on one and 67 on the other to 63 and 68. So we had a number of these. And what we now plot here is the difference between these minima. And it turns out that the number that we have the equilibrium I do the zero point down here, then we have about 5% more in density on the proximal side than on the distal side. Why does that make sense? It makes sense because what the support mainly does is suppresses fluctuation. That means by virtue of that, the proximal side is closer to the phase transition, to the alveolar phase than the distal side. Therefore, as it's close to the phase transition effectively, it has to be, has to have a higher density. There are even experimental indications that you can make supported bilayers where one side is an LB and the other side is an LB. So the, 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 bottom, the bottom side, the one which is close to the support, is higher order. And it has a higher density. So, as I can now go to use another model to just look at supported bilayers. This is one by Ira Cook, Cook, here by Marcus Becerra. This is, yeah, now your whole lipid, of about 150 atoms, is now just represented by three peaks. One hand group, purely repulsive, two tails, attractive. <coughs> but not normal and not chance, but this specific interaction. The problem with normal level jokes would be you can get a perfectly self assembled bilayer, which is a question. You don't need that. Because as the level jokes is so short range and there's no water in there, the system would always sit perfectly on top of each other and would crystallize. Now, by making this attraction much longer range, now the lipid below doesn't really care if the lipid above is sitting directly on top or slightly moving around. So, that way, you are getting a self-assembling fluid yes. So, we used this model and put it on a support. It was in collaboration actually with Marcus Sanders' script. 
This is how the system looks like. And so the blue ones are the tail, the other head groups, the black ones are the tails. This is probably what you're allowed to do. We measured now the density profile, and this is now showing all, all three reads on both sides. So the left hand side is the free bar layer, the right hand side is the supported bar layer. What you again see is that the disk leaflet, this one, is not too different from the proximal leaflet, whereas the proximal leaflet is significantly different from a free body. And the main difference is localization. It's again the support localizes your, your lipids, it kills entropy. It kills entropy quite dramatically. We did a comparison. We measured the entropy difference between this distribution and this distribution. K L and P. We get about a quarter of the absorption energy is killed by the positional entropy, by the decrease in positional entropy. So this is actually a repulsive force on the body. But the, the attraction of between the body and the support is stronger, but this is something which you must not ignore. At the same time, if you integrate these three peaks, Against these three peaks together, you get the asymmetry again between the two sides. And you were actually surprised the also was 5% difference, because this, map, this map is fast enough, so we see it. So we see um, little flip flop. So again, you get about 5% higher density in the proximal side again, in the proximal side against the distal side. I think that means essentially that we are the same distance from. Um, the, or essentially the same distance from the main That would be like this. Another thing we measure is now the tension in the lipid as a function of area. So we can measure pressure, two dimensional pressure. And these are NPT simulations. In this case, and these are NPT simulations at a number of different areas keeping the number of lipids the same. The first one is the red one, that is the free body. There are two things which are important here. One is where this goes through zero. That is the area per molecule. In this case, 1.22 sigma squared per minute. We could use now this and map this one, how big the area per molecule is. The other thing is the slope of this. The slope of this is the area compressibility of this. It tells us how easy or difficult it is to expand or compress. Now, we took the blue one. The blue one is the support body. Again, we see, the first of all, that this average area of the molecule is decreasing. So, the bilayer is compacter, but only 1.22 to 1.19. That's a little bit. The difference in slope, however, That means it is 65% harder to compress the support of bilayer than the free one. So what does that again mean? That again, so what is this related to? This is related to fluctuations. It's a fluctuation graph. Again, the suppression of fluctuation is the major effect support has on bilayer. It suppresses the fluctuation that messes with the entropy. That messes with all fluctuation quantities. That is, the area compression of the modulus. Doesn't make actually sense to measure bending modulus because there is a, you can bend up but you cannot bend down. So, and bending up means you go with desor, then you cannot really mesh, distinguish between bending and desorption. But area compressibility modulus is actually something which can be experimentally measured. And what we now can do, okay, we can. They games to make not only simple substrates, but we can do all kinds of complex systems. We can take something like a carbon nanotube, or we can take these systems and let the membrane expand. And these are things which experimentally are being produced in nanotechnology. So they now make these kind of troughs and put the proteins exactly here, that the protein has minimal interaction with the substrate, 
And then as long as this one spans, you have the mechanical stability of a solid substrate, but you have for the protein an environment which is close to a free binding. So you have people are now starting to make exactly these kind of systems. Yes. The problem is, for any atomistic simulation, that is, this is way too large. This is way too large to have any atomistic simulation. You may be able to do this on a Martini level, but not atomistic. More recently, we started to look into, as that we want to go, we want to go to So the first thing we have to understand is what does these tablets do. So, in, before we go to Tablet binding also went to something what you call a tablet. That's a membrane, that's a lipid here, and the lipid now has connected to its head a polymer. This polymer is actually polyethylene glycol. Polyethylene glycol is more soluble, biocompatible, and one of the standard um, polymers being used in order to tablet binding to a substrate. And um, Shoshuang actually did a simulation now just a mixture of EOPC and calculated EOPC without any substrates. So, this is EOPC. So, EOPC is now both sides, both tails have a kick. <coughs> both tails are monounsaturated. It's oleo. So, the oleo that means that's the fatty acid coming out of all the products. That's the energy that comes from. It's C18 and has double bond between position 9 and 10. And we put a calculation on it, and this is actually an uncharged calculator. Yeah, most calculators are actually the head of the skirt is removed here, and then you have a fully head, you have a chip, and then you have practically a charge. But we left the coding group on in order to avoid the additional problem of charging, so the vertical ones there. So this is how the system looks like. If you just take the normal system standard conditions and you throw it in water, it does not form a binding of the bicycle. But this is one quarter of the lipids are pegulated. And that is about realistically how strong we tether up experimental systems are. You normally have about every third to fifth lipid tethered to the substrate. So this is a realistic comparison. Um, it's probably hard to see the difference between pink and red, the red eye to the X. Why does it not form a binary? Yeah? Effectively, the pack makes the head group large, and then you have the standard theory, you have a you have cylindrical man, uh, cylindrical lipid, makes a binary. Yeah? You have a conical lipid with a large head group, makes a micelle, you have a conical lipid with a small head group, makes an invert. If the lipid is actually the head proof and the tail have the same area, they nicely pack it in the body. If you have a large head group, small tail, you have something which looks like this. If you pack them all together, now of course, not as bad as I do it here, but you get a nice one. The inverse, so if you have very small head group and large, the large tails, you get what is called an invert. So that's exactly what we see here. You make our head group effectively larger, you get a micelle. You make you get even something which is called curvature sorting. Because the number of packs at the end of this, which is essentially a bicell, is, is higher, and the number of packs in here is lower. The packs go to the area of high curvature and they avoid the area of low curvature. And we get curvature sorting in a bicycle. And you can't put the system by changing the conditions, so we put the system under a strain. This is essentially now the right hand side is we put the surface tension on the system, we pull in one direction, and we get this back. So we can, by changing the surface tension between these two sides, we can switch between the bilayer and the bicycle. And now, Take the system and we chemically craft it to a substrate. 
Do you tell a father of the work of Shuri Yud? Again, we have our peg is actually a bit too hyperfluid, but it's actually a, we made it on purpose like that, that we don't have the issue that we may have not perfect solution in water. So this is a peg, peg tether, with this proximal input and this input, all the pegs are in the proximal input. That again is the way experiments are normally made of these systems. You don't have three pegs on the other side. So essentially what you have here, you have a polymer brush, and the polymer brush is capped by your visor. And, and we are talking here of a few, it's not we have the dense polymer brush, but we are already in the brush regime for people who do polymers. Now our tether density per square nanometer is between 0.1 to 0.6 tethers per square nanometer. So one tether is between one and a half, has one and a half, yeah, one and a half to six square nanometers per tether. So the problem is now this is that you have a huge parameter. Yeah. Tether length, you have graphic density, you have temperature, you have um, whatever limits you want to use, and so on. We started with looking at tether length and graph length. So you, make, you can make these tethers differently long, between 5 and 25 in this case. Units with the mapping is essentially a 1 to 2, so um, one cross grain peg is two effective peg um, monomers in experiments. And yes, here, and you put them all on the square grid because in independent studies of Polymer brushes, we have seen that it actually doesn't matter. At reasonably high polymer graph density, um, if you put them in a square grid or whatever, that is at this distance from the surface, actually, this battery is gone. So, especially at high graph densities, we've, we've looked into that independently before another project, and we see, okay, we can do everything on the square grid. But this is how the system looks like. This is how the system from the top. Again, we have about in this case, about 800 limits in the system. So 400, roughly 400 on either side. And about 60,000, uh, about 40,000 cross grain water, so about 60,000 attraction sites. And the, they are just, the, the limits here, uh, the tethers here, they are just fixed. They are just fixed in position. There is not really a, a true bond to the substrate bond. They are just that they are, they are there and they, are, they don't move the lowest molecule. We look at, ten, uh, we look at density profiles. There's a freestanding bilayer, there's now a tethered bilayer. You see the red one is the PEX. The blue is the uh, proximal leaflet. The purple is the distal leaflet. This is a system where the tethering leads to a larger water difference than can be had in so you can, this way, and this is actually the repulse entropy of the pegs, you can push the binding up further away from the substrate using such tether binding. The brush does not collapse. If you make even longer, eventually the brush will collapse. And they get, again, closer, so we cannot just make the pegs infinitely long to push it infinitely away from the surface. It doesn't work. But we get further away from the surface at the cost, however, that we now have these artificial packs floating around in the system. But probably this one is better for a working environment because it's not sitting as close as substrate and the other side. Um, yes, and this is the electrical diffusivity. And again, you see that if you push them further and further away, that we actually get higher diffusivities, the outer leaflet doesn't really care, but the inner leaflet becomes more and more normal to the, more and more similar event, but there is a cap at one point, essentially, they just stay there, and the file and the text are also on the Okay, so we have looked at cross simulations of support binary and tether interactions, 
and more and more towards what real people do in biomedical technology. You see especially that approximately the possibility of effect by what I want to do. If you put X in there, if you put a substrate in there. But this leaflet is reasonably close to support the final. And what you see is essentially the pressure profile as well as the dynamics are significantly asymmetric. So whatever people study with the support binary is very valuable, but it's not a free value migrate and it's not Thank you. We have our own we have all the Martini water. We have oh. we have an adapted creation of Martini water. Um, because the old Martini 1.4 freezes, the new Martini actually phase separates. If you put a substrate in there, so we have a special version which is a, a our martini water is a bit too hydrophobic. Oh, but, that's, but that's the best we can do. It's a simple energy challenge, it's a bit more hydrophobic, but actually in our one, the Eric molecule is a bit too large, but at the same time, our permeability coefficient for water is now the correct one, which, which none of the real Martinis gets right. And the mystic is extremely hard. There are some work people have, or people have done. They have drilled essentially a hole in the support to let the water equilibrate between the two sides. So I have not seen really an atomistic simulation done perfectly right. The problem for that is what you would have to do first free energy calculation to calculate how much water you need below. You probably at the same time need to get a free energy calculation to get the asymmetry right. Because if you just, what we found, if you just put the bilayer on a support and you don't get all of these things right, 